Um, so as I mentioned earlier when we did introductions, my name is Matt. I'm a former member of the Flutter team. I was on the team from 2018 to 2020. And uh, since 2020, I've been working as a Flutter consultant, corporate trainer, developer, all of those things. And tonight, I just want to give you some updates on various things I've been working on. I actually expected this group to mostly be the same as it was last time. I'm actually happy to see a bunch of new people here from many different companies. Um, the last time I was here, I talked a lot about Super Editor, which is an entire document editing toolkit built with Flutter for Flutter developers. Um, and then tonight, I just want to talk about some of the things I've been working on in addition to that. So what you see up here on this first slide are my two different initiatives. So on the one hand, I have Super Declarative, which is focused on education, creative coding, pixel painting, that kind of thing. And then on the other side is the Flutter Bounty Hunters, which is a remote development agency focused on open source Flutter and Dart development. So let's talk about some of the things that, uh, that we've been doing. First, since I was last here, I released something called Flutter Processing. Now, with a show of hands, who's familiar with processing itself? Anybody? No? Okay. Processing is about a 20-year-old technology and uh, originally created with the Java programming language, but it was an IDE and a set of APIs that were used for doing all sorts of creative coding, pixel painting, you might even do some simulations, you might create some art installations, but it's kind of been this overlap between getting people into visual programming as well as giving artists a way to express themselves from a programming context. And so my thought was, wouldn't it be great if you could learn all of that creative coding, but also do it with a language and some APIs that you can turn into a career? Because historically that hasn't really been the case. Java was there for Android for a while, but Java on Android was so different than Java on anything else that it didn't really count. Um, and so I thought, why don't I port those APIs over to Flutter so that you can do processing style coding with Flutter? To give you an example of just some things painted with Flutter processing, these are some snapshots out of the example app. Now the two examples in the bottom are, are mostly circles and lines, uh, so you could paint that with a custom painter in Flutter if you wanted to. But notice that the two examples in the top are actually based on true pixel painting. We talk a lot about pixel painting with Flutter, but honestly most of what you do are, is vector graphics, which is not pixels at all. It goes to Skia, Skia turns those vector graphics into pixels in the GPU. But to accomplish these two effects that you see at the top, you actually need to paint pixels on top of the previous pixels, on top of the previous pixels. It actually is bitmap style painting. And I've made that possible in Flutter by porting those processing APIs over. You can literally set an individual pixel color, and you can query an individual pixel color, and it opens up all those creative opportunities. So here's an example of uh, a little bit of Flutter processing code that's running. The code over on the left is all you need to accomplish that goal on the right. Now here again, you could paint this with a custom painter, but it's just giving you a sense for what the code might look like. This is actually based on a video by The Coding Train on YouTube, which is a channel full of traditional processing style creations, and we're creating a bit of a floral pattern here referred to as phylotaxis. If you download or clone the Flutter processing repo, the example ha app has all sorts of creations with Flutter processing. This will be one of them, and you can check it out yourself. So also on the super declarative front, I recently started a new video series called the Flutter Clone Wars, where I take popular apps, I take pieces of those apps, and I clone them with Flutter, and I show you how to actually create those clones in videos. So for example, here are three recent creations. Two of these are from the Robinhood app, from the crypto UI for the Robinhood app. And then recently I cloned the floating stars from the Starbucks app when you earn a free coffee. And I'll be turning that into the actual rewards tracker in the future. And uh, if you're wondering, since this is the Flutter C Clone Wars, I do in fact code with a Stormtrooper helmet on. So all those other channels out there, they give you the background music and the transitions, but you tell me who's willing to put a bucket on their head for you for entertainment purposes. And I dare you to try to find your keyboard with one of those helmets on. Okay, so now let's switch over to the Flutter Bounty Hunter side of things. Uh, there have been a few package releases that some of you might be interested in. One of them is Super Banners. So anybody here who's run a Flutter app knows about that infamous debug banner in the upper right corner, upper upper right corner. Now maybe you want to show some messages like that yourself, but if you ever dug into that banner, you'll realize it's a render object that very carefully puts that debug text in the right place. It's not something you can use in general. But your product, you might want to say this version is alpha, or beta, or QA, or you're in offline mode, or maybe you just want to let the world know that you've built your app with Flutter. So these are actual widgets 
uh, created with the Super Banners package. This is a real rendering in Flutter where you can see that these banners actually position and, cr and expand their width to fit the built with Flutter message. But not just the built with Flutter message. You can put any widget tree inside of the corner banner widget. So what it does uh, in this render object is it takes your subtree, lays it out, says how tall are you, rotates your subtree to the right location, and then makes the banner wide enough or thin enough to just fit your content. So now you can go create all of those banners of your own. They can say whatever you want. Let's talk about super text layout. So last time I was here, again, I assumed most of you were going to be the same people from last time, so this may be new to many of you. Um, but I'm the, the lead developer on a project called Super Editor, which is the primary document implementation for a company called Superlist, as well as a set of tools used by um, companies Clearful and Turtle. They've all helped to fund this project through the Flutter Bounty Hunters. And one of the challenges that we had to solve was how to deal with text selection. So we are literally painting this text selection, the blue boxes right there and the carrot, we're actually putting that on screen. And this led to a problem, which I call the next frame problem. If you want to paint anything based on text layout, you first have to lay out the text and then do the painting. You have to pump one frame for the text, and then on the next frame, you do your layout based on those characters. And uh, among just kind of being annoying from a timing standpoint, it also results in this possibility that even when you think you can access the text layout, it's invalid because the text has already changed to a different piece of text. And so you go try to access the layout and it blows up and says, hey, our layout isn't valid. And uh, to make things really fun, there's no way to ask if it's valid. There's no property, there's no method, it just blows up on you. So we had code literally wrapped with try catch blocks and then we just keep scheduling frames. So I'm happy to say that with the super text package, uh, super text layout, which we recently released, we have solved that problem. So for example, what you're seeing on the screen here, these colors that are based on the character boxes and the line boxes, those are painted in the exact same frame as the text layout. No more timing issue, no more exceptions that are thrown. We've all we've gotten that in the same step of the pipeline. And if you're wondering what these weird colors have to do with selection, again, the only difference between that and what you're used to is that if you make it a light blue color, suddenly you have a normal text selection box. But the point is it's always based on text layout. And then Cutting Room, uh, I think this is my first public announcement of the release of this package. I have put this out in the last week or so, but uh, a few months ago, I put out a package called FFmpeg CLI. That was a Dart package for composing FFmpeg commands to render video. The difficulty is that even putting those commands together in Dart is hugely complicated because those commands are hugely complicated. So I created an abstraction on top called Cutting Room, which allows you to compose video structure in a similar way that you do with widget trees. So let's just take a look at a couple examples. Uh, I pulled a couple videos here from the Flutter Video Player package, so hopefully they're not licensed. But if we play those, these are just a few seconds of a bee and a butterfly. And let's say we take those clips and we want to play them back to back in series. In Cutting Room, we can start by defining those video compositions. We're going to take the full video of each one, not clips, but the whole thing. And then we're going to put those in a series composition, a composition that, that, dis that will render the videos in series. And you can start to see how this looks a little bit like a widget tree. Let's take this composition and let's put it through a composition builder. And here we're going to say what the output size is and the output path, and we're going to run the command. But the important part remains that series composition. And at the end of this, if we run this code, we will get one video clip followed by the other. And there we go. So that was all rendered through Cutting Room talking to, to FFmpeg behind the scenes. But okay, that's really simple. You're saying, hey, that's the, about as easy as an FFmpeg command can be. How about something a little more complicated? Let's take this example. Let's say we still have the content that we had before, but we want an intro and we want an outro. And not before and after the content, but slightly overlapping. So the intro reveals the content with a circle reveal, and the outro hides the content with another circle reveal. This means they have to overlap. And that's actually quite difficult with FFmpeg and the filter graph. But it's going to be quite easy with Cutting Room. So let's return to our series composition, and let's just wrap that with something we call a layer. 
and we're going to put it in a layer span. That span is going to start about two seconds into the video because we want time for the intro, and then it's going to play as long as it wants. Let's add a second layer. This layer is going to have two spans. The first span is for the intro, which begins immediately, that's the duration.0, and it plays this file called example intro.move. And then a second span, which despite the integer math there, is about at the end of the video, the end of the video minus a little bit, that's our outro, which plays example outro.move. Take those two layers, stick them in a layered composition. And the rest of this is what you saw before, the output size, the output path, and then running the command, we just switched our composition. And then we get this, this is playing. So you saw the transition from the intro to the content, and we'll see from the content to the outro. So if you haven't worked with FFmpeg, go give it a try so you can appreciate how much easier that is than the alternative. But this project is now available on Pub. It's a proof of concept, so I use this to produce all of my videos. But for any company that would like to make use of this, like to productionize it, we're looking for funding to bring companies in and take a stake in the future of that project. And the last thing I'll talk about, because we have FFmpeg CLI, we have Cutting Room, the next thing we're looking at is, well, with this ability to, to put videos together and to render them, wouldn't it be nice as Flutter developers if one of the things in those videos could be your Flutter UI? Why not render that to a video? You've already seen me include multiple of those videos here. So something that we're looking into is the idea of taking Flutter code, piping it through to a headless version of Flutter, meaning no window, you can't see anything, but there's Flutter, there's the rendering system, and then out the other side is that video of your actual Flutter code. And in theory, with this tool, you can put all these, all the three tools together, and you can just generate an entire video, including your Flutter examples and demos, and you don't need a human to be involved at all. And there are some other ways to make use of this tool, which is, you know, imagine that your company deals with real-time signals, whether that's weather or the stock market or whatever, and you'd like to actually render charts or animations or any kind of video and post to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, this is the kind of tool that can run then on your web server, take those signals in and, and consistently put out updated videos as needed. Another interesting use case is that when you're onboarding developers, whether to a proprietary system or an open source system, one of the best ways to teach a developer is to show a video of an area of the app doing something. Now it's always tempting, you drop the developer in there, say, hey, clone the repo, go poke around the app and figure it out. But we all know there are things blocked off by special admin accounts or different levels of roles, things that are kind of hidden, and those developers just aren't going to find them. But if, as you write your source code, if you were to write little video containers the way you might write tests, and those video containers just generate little videos of your app, you can easily inject them right into your documentation, your readme, wherever you decide to put your information about how your app works. And then you can give those new developers a much easier onboarding experience where they can see everything that's happening. And it's not a mock-up, it's not from the team that went through Premiere and After Effects on the design side, it's your actual app doing what it does. Um, and to make all of that, all of those points very clear, so again, you can, in this case, you could use Flutter to paint images and videos to social media. You could generate demo videos um, showing what, you know, put it in your project docs. You can generate demos for your presentations. How many of us stand up in, in meetups and conferences like this and we show off what we've created, yet the, I'd be a person that opens up QuickTime and creates the rectangle and records it and all that stuff. You can skip all that with this tool. Um, and also, for the few people like me on YouTube, you could directly pipe those Flutter demos into educational videos. So that project, we believe we know how to build it. I'm here mentioning it because we are looking as well for funding to get that project started. Uh, it's just a matter of bringing the companies together that can gain value from it. So if, if that is your company, I'd love to talk to you about that. But uh, whether you'd like to help fund any Flutter Bounty Hunter projects, or if you're an experienced Flutter developer and you'd like to join the team, please come and talk to me. And those are the updates from Super Declarative and uh, the Flutter Bounty Hunters. Be happy to take any questions if we have time.
Should I repeat the question for the recording? Okay. Uh, so if I summarize the question, we currently have golden tests, which are screenshot tests. Could we have video tests? Could we have some video indication of what happens when we run a test? Certainly you could. In terms of comparison, like if the video itself is the artifact you're testing, the problem there is video encoding. Not only does that take a long time, did I, did I get it, your question wrong? Sure. Okay. So videos to interrogate what happened during your test. Um, I don't see any reason you couldn't. Now the question is, where would you insert that control? You might need to get it. You might need to extend the test runner. You might need to build your own test runner. But the wonderful thing about being in Dart is that once you're in Dart and your test is in Dart, yeah, you can absolutely call anything you want. This tool does require FFmpeg, so you have to have that on your path wherever you're running that test. But assuming you do, absolutely, you can compose that command right in the middle of your test, um, and you could render it out. Uh, now, again, the, the part that renders Flutter doesn't exist yet, but if it did, yes, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to use that in your test suite anywhere you want. And just to make sure everyone um, understands this, Fl Dart and Flutter tests are just normal Dart scripts. The only question is what you do in there. So often the first thing you do is say import package test or import package flutter test. It's still just a normal Dart application. It just happens to be doing testing things. Um, and so that to your to your point, yes, you could do anything you could do in your in a Dart app, you can do in a Dart test, including rendering. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, yeah, so the question is how we work with companies who are funding the projects. So yes, it, it all of our work immediately goes to open source. What funding does is one, it gets the tool built, and two, any funding company absolutely has influence over what features we build or don't build or what the APIs might look like. Um, and so, you know, the way I describe this is if your company needs a tool, you're gonna you're gonna pay for that tool either way. The question then becomes, do you want to be on the hook for every new feature? in that tool? Do you want to be on the hook for every bug fix? Do you want to be on the hook for 100% of the cost? Do you want to be on the hook for 100% of the time? Or would you rather say, look, this particular tool, it's not core to our business. We just need it. So why don't we split the cost with other companies? Why don't we have these Flutter Bounty Hunters developers worry about it instead of our team? That's the advantage that you get. Sure. Anybody else? Nobody's curious about any of it, not even the Stormtrooper helmet? I'm oh, sorry, in the back and then we'll go up front. There are definitely some other characters that we support. Um, we haven't really taken an explicit look at non-English languages, but certainly, like on the Superlist side, we have a number of German users, and so they're en they enter various special characters. Uh, we're actually in the middle right now of trying to get that to work better on, on desktop um, because we have to go through what's known as the input method engine. Uh, and just a little bit of history here, our first implementation, our original implementation, actually handled every single keyboard key directly. So if you type H, we said, okay, that's the H key, we'll put an H in the document. Uh, the longer term solution is we have to defer to the OS, which you have to do on mobile, but on desktop that's a choice. So now the Mac OS, for example, will tell us what we need to change in the document, and we're in the process of fully integrating that capability, but as we speak I have some pull requests up that deal with some special characters and the ability to enter those. Sure. There's a question up here. I So do I have a clone trooper helmet? I don't because um, so I have a Stormtrooper helmet. The clone, there was no Clone Trooper helmet from that line. I did look. I tried to find one. I ended up with uh, two different, the, the original Stormtrooper and the new Stormtrooper. Um, write the other 900 commits. <laughs> 
so it, it was super editor so I mean first with the way that that, that project got started uh, Chris sells who at the time was a PM on the flutter team got some developers together got some companies together and said you know we think it'd be nice if the community had document editing and out of those companies there was one that was serious about funding it and out of the developers I was the one who was serious about building it and so we started working together from that point forward and as the project moved forward um, a couple other companies saw the value of it and joined the funding as well but at this point I'm still I'm probably almost every commit on there and there are maybe a few dozen that came from other people um, I guess the difficulty isn't necessarily getting people to commit but getting them to commit code that you actually want in the code base it's it needs to be tested it needs to be readable like this stuff is once it's open source like that's not up for debate because someone's gonna have to continue that code and if I can't understand it if other developers can't understand it if we don't know what it was supposed to do which is by the way what tests tell you is what it's supposed to do it's okay that'll work for 10 minutes and then we got to get rid of it or something um, and so like right now I have a number of people going through kind of a probationary period with the flutter bounty hunters to make sure that okay can you write code that can be read can you write the tests that go with it And if they can they'll be on the team and they'll be part of that group of people committing so I'm sorry I don't have any secrets for you there it's it's just kind of a, a rough road any other questions all right well thanks for your time